So dear Archbishop, priests, brothers and sisters, I'm going to deal with a topic which is quite recent in biblical scholarship. It's just in its germinating phase. And we call this study a method of interpreting scripture or reading the scripture as ecological hermeneutics. So, dear friends, the schema which I am going to present to you, how I am going to present this paper, as this method is new, at the very beginning I am going to introduce what is ecological hermeneutics. And then, to apply this method to a scripture passage, I have chosen Isaiah 44, 21 to 28. It's a passage from a book from prophet Isaiah. And this part of the book, chapter 40 to 55, is traditionally called Deutero Isaiah. And I'm going to deal in brief the historical setting and the religious setting in which Deutero Isaiah wrote this book. And then to apply this method, I'm going to use the traditional tools of exegesis, the structural analysis of the text followed by an exegetical analysis. Now, I'm going to incorporate both ecological hermeneutics along with this traditional tools of exegesis to arrive at my thesis that the voices of earth and humanity are agents in Isaiah 44. So now, I begin with introducing what is ecological hermeneutics. In 1967, Lynn White Jr., in his article, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, placed the blame for the modern ecological crisis upon Western Christianity and its anthropocentric traditions. His article sparked heated debates among biblical scholars and theologians as it asserted that the mandate of domination in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, gave a free hand to humans for the exploitation of earth, he stated, we shall continue to have a worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve men. Sadly, the ecological crisis is worse than it was half a century ago when Lynn White wrote this article. It is high time that we read our scriptures from a fresh perspective, the perspective of earth. It is time that we realize that the rights of our planet have been violated and that as members of the earth community and as kings of earth, we are to render its justice. To that end, ecological hermeneutics is an honest endeavor of biblical scholars to discover a fresh the neglected traditions within the biblical text that reflect our kinship with earth. It seeks to listen to earth as a subject in the text rather than a topic of discussion. In this new way of reading the sacred text, we are no longer reading as stewards over creation, but as keen relatives within the earth community. The Earth Bible Project team presents six eco-justice principles that seek to retrieve and help us understand the scripture from the perspective of earth. What are those principles? The first, the principle of intrinsic worth. This fundamental principle asserts that earth and its components have value in themselves and not because they have utilitarian value for humans living on earth. The principle of interconnectedness. This principle focuses on the fact that earth is a community of interconnected living things that are mutually dependent on each other for life and survival. The principle of voice, based on the growing consciousness among ecologists, bi biologists, theologians, that earth is a living entity, both 
biologically and spiritually, this principle asserts that Earth is a subject capable of raising its voice in celebration and against injustice. The principle of purpose. This principle declares that the Earth and all its components are part of a dynamic design within which each piece has a place in the overall design goal of that design. The principle of mutual custodianship. Designed to reflect the role of human beings in the Earth community, this principle declares that Earth is a balanced and diverse do domain where responsible custodians of, can function as partners rather than rulers to sustain the balance and diverse Earth community. And the sixth, the principle of resistance. This principle states that the Earth and its components not only suffer from injustice at the hands of humans, but actively resist them in the struggle for justice. Now we employ these principles to pose questions to the text through a basic hermeneutical process of suspicion, identification, and retrieval. In the suspicion aspect, we can legit legitimately suspect that the biblical texts written by human beings reflect the primary interests of human beings, their welfare, their relationship with God, and their salvation. In other words, these are anthropocentric texts. The second aspect in the task is the task of empathy or identification. It requires the reader to acknowledge and come to terms with his or her deep ecological connections, which in turn would raise our consciousness to the injustices against earth as portrayed in the text. The third facet is that of retrieval, which seeks to honor traditions about earth in the text that have been unnoticed, suppressed, or hidden. Thus, our task as biblical teachers and readers is to set aside our anthropocentric biases and identify with earth so that we act where Earth or members of the Earth community have suffered, resisted, or been excluded in the history of textual interpretation. Having said this, now I introduce to you the author, the historical setting to which I have taken the passage of Isaiah 44. Deutero Isaiah, which consists of chapters 40 to 55, or is often called the prophet of consolation, preached a reassuring message of hope to the 6th century BC Judean exiles in Babylon who were distraught by the persuasive Babylonian propaganda that Marduk, the god of Babylonians, had defeated Yahweh as his temple lay in ruins in Jerusalem. You can see here the picture, the temple of Jerusalem and the people being taken to exile by the Babylonian king Nabuchadnezzar are now captives in a foreign land. In this historical context of Deutero Isaiah, the same God who had judged Israel and Judah for her sins and had sent so many of her citizens into exile was now announcing that he would act redemptively on her behalf through Cyrus the Persian king. Isaiah 43, 1. For this good tidings, the author breaks out in words of praise for the sovereignty of Yahweh and invites the constituents of earth to join in the jubilation. A cursory glance, now we come to the idea of suspicion. A cursory glance to the interpretive history of our text, Isaiah 44, 21 to 28, reveals to us that the redemption of Israel from Babylon and exile is the primary theme for the exegetical theological commentaries. This suspected anthropocentric reading can be summed up in the words of commentator Watts. He says, 44.23 is a hymnic call to praise, call to all Israel and nations to praise God's decision and actions to redeem Jacob. Scholars conveniently fail to recognize the role of earth and its status in this hymnic call 
to praise which so evidently calls on nature to join in the jubilation of Israel's redemption. With the eco-justice principles being our guiding light, along with the hermeneutical precepts of suspicion, identification, and retrieval, we shall present a systematic analysis of the text structure and a brief exegetical analysis, which I believe will indicate the equitable role of earth and humanity in Yahweh's plan for salvation. At the outset, you have a li uh, leaflet with you, which gives you the translation of our text. Now, whenever we do exegesis of a text, the first step is we see what the text says. We define the structure. It is like tearing down the text into small intelligible pieces. And when we do that, the text itself, we don't call it inspired just for the sake of being inspired. But it is indeed inspired because the text speaks. And the structure of the text speaks in itself. And when I was doing my studies on this topic, Isaiah 44, 21, the structure I have given to you. So I will go directly to the structure of the text. I have divided 21 to 28 into two parts. The first part is God speaking. He's addressing. And he's addressing whom? Not just the human community. Here we see 21 to 22. He's addressing Israel. Israel are the addressee. Whereas in verses 23, earth is the addressee. Now we see here, which are marked in red, are two imperatives or commands. The commands which God gives to Israel is remember. And why they have to remember? For the Lord, for you are my servant. And the second command is to return. Why they have to return? Because God is redeeming them. And the second part, verse 23, speaks of earth as the addressee. Now because God is redeeming Israel, the author breaks forth into him. He says, shout, O heavens, sing, O mountains, and break forth in rejoicing. Now we see the commands in the first part as well as in the second part. So part two, now part two of our pericope speaks about the sovereignty of Yahweh. And the Lord is sovereign, has authority, not just, not just over human beings, but also over earth. As you can see, he is sovereign over earth and is sovereign over humanity. And finally, the final verse is verses 27 to 28. It defines that Yahweh, we usually read, as I was just mentioning to you, the anthropocentric biases that we have. The authors, the commentaries only speak about Cyrus, but they miss the point of earth also is a subject who is an agent in the works of Yahweh's salvation. So dear friends, the structure of our pericope has revealed to us the intrinsic worth of earth as its constituents are addressed as subjects. So they are not a, merely an object, just as Israel is addressed, the earth itself is addressed as subjects in the text. Furthermore, the interconnectedness between earth and humanity is indicated when Yahweh acts redemptively in the historical setting of the exile and humanity's kin, earth, is called upon to share in the joy of its redemption. Significantly, the structure reveals that earth and humanity are instruments in the hands of Yahweh. It's not just man. It is earth and humanity. They are instruments in the hands of Yahweh who are to fulfill his purposes, thereby indicating that each member of the earth community has a purpose to accomplish in the overall design of Yahweh. Having said this, we go to the second part, a brief exegetical analysis of the text. The first part, 44, 21 to 28. Now Israelites here, 
Whenever I mention this, you can just refer to the text which is there with you. If you have any questions, then you can raise later. In the first 21 to 22, Israel is addressed with two significant imperatives. Remember and return. What are they to remember and why are they to return? Although there is no scholarly consensus on the referent of the demonstrative Elle, this is the demonstrative Elle, these things, which follows the imperatives, remember, we opine that it plays a retrospective role within the context of this pericope. The Israelites are to remember the things told to them in former times, the experiences of the wondrous redemptive acts of Yahweh. Thus, for the Israelites, remembering is not a noetic action. It's not remembering, we usually refer to the mind as the action of the intellect, but it is not a noetic action, but a realization to act on their unique call as Yahweh's servants who will never be forgotten. Thus, Yahweh's personal and intimate relationship with Israel is demonstrated by his ardent call to return. They are to remember, but remembering involves heeding or an action to return because Yahweh is redeeming them. The call to return underscores one of significant points in Deuteronomy Isaiah, the importance of human response to the divine initiative. It is founded on the belief that Yahweh is their only Redeemer, just as the Redeemer in the sociological arena of the ancient Near East or the biblical world had to buy back his skin from slavery or from bondage, Yahweh buys back Israel out of exilic servitude. This relationship of Yahweh with Israel, which is neither of blood nor of tribal kinship, is formed by the covenant. As such, it obliges both the parties, Yahweh and Israel, to respect the terms of the covenant, which here would imply Israel through the action of returning to Yahweh, and Yahweh, on his part, redeeming them from exile. Oswald, a famous commentator on Isaiah, pointedly states, the great danger of the exile would not be that God would be unable to act, but that Israel would fail to respond in faith to his actions. An invitation to return is placed before the Israelites. Their positive or negative response will have its related consequences. The author is definitely silent about their response. Will this silence be observed by the human counterpart, Earth? In verse 23, which is addressed to Earth, traditionally, 4423 is understood as a hymnic call to praise. Is that it? Is it just a hymn? Is it just a poetic trick? Most scholars define the language of this verse as a metaphor. Nonetheless, we should not quickly discard it as a poetic feature, a matter of expression of form with no substance. Thus I ask, what is the function of a metaphor, metaphor in text like this? We would argue that metaphor involves the just position of two different thoughts, images, concepts that interact with each other and remain in tension with each other. In this text, the heavens are invited to sing, the depths to shout out, and the mountains to break forth in song. The image of mountains, which are generally, which we generally view as silent, invited to break forth in singing, surprises us and forces us to reflect on the connection between the two ideas, the mountains being silent, which we have, and the now in the text, the mountains being called to shout out, to sing. The fact that singing, shouting out, and breaking forth in singing are human characteristics in no way negates this interaction. Wallace radically states, 
the use of metaphor in these texts does not lessen the validity of the statement that earth has a voice with which to praise God. Rather, without the use of the metaphor, the psalmist or the author would not open our minds, let alone our ears, to hear earth's voice. The metaphor points to a reality embodied within the physical world, one that our contemporary Western minds are not usually trained to comprehend. Thus, singing, shouting and breaking forth in rejoicing by earth in jubilation is not a poetic trick, but indicates that earth as a subject with its intrinsic worth has a voice to express its joy. In fact, it takes us back to the experiences of indigenous people who have kinship with creation that our Western thinking has abandoned. Many Aboriginal people seem to have the capacity to hear the mountains sing and they communicate with trees, rivers, wild animals with distinct voices. For them, earth is a sacred subject. It is alive. The understanding negates the just hymnology understanding and presents earth as a subject with a voice in the text. Further, through the employment of the literary device of merism, merism means when you say heaven and earth, whatever comes between that all is included. The author indicates to the reader that the entire universe is exhorted to join in the celebration of humanity's freedom. As the elements of the universe were called on to witness Israel's rebellion in Isaiah 1-2, they are here called on to rejoice over Israel's salvation. The cycle will be complete when the heaven and earth themselves participate in the redemption. Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. Now we go to the next. The sovereignty of Yahweh over earth and humanity. Verses 24 to 26 begins with the formula of prophetic announcement. Thus says the Lord and is addressed to the Israelites. It comprises of a continuous chain of participle clauses that qualify the initial, I am the Lord. Anokhi Adonai Yeshekol. I am the Lord who does all things. This descriptive arrangement proclaims that everything exudes from Yahweh. From the creation of the heavens to the specific details of Cyrus's career. More importantly, the purposeful, purposeful use of participles point to a continuous state of action for an indefinite duration. Thus, the participle, Oshe, to do, to create, carries the fuller meaning. God is ever busy creating, never beginning, never stopping, just creating. Once this foundational confession that Yahweh is sovereign over the whole of creation is made, the oracle further indicates Yahweh's authority over humanity. Now in Babylonian religious life, we know that they had the idea of consulting the omens. They, some of the ways in which they used to put oil into water. And depending on the pattern which the oil brings out, they would understand, they would interpret what do the gods want. Another way was they used to consult the liver or the viscera of sacrificed animals. They would study that and see what do the gods want. Are the gods happy or are the gods sad? So these ideas were already present to Deutero Isaiah. And therefore, it is inevitable that Deutero Isaiah would not speak against them. He spoke against them which we see, therefore, Yahweh's authority over humanity is demonstrated on the one hand as he invalidates the prediction of the Babylonian diviners, and on the other hand, he validates and establishes the word of his servants as a further polemic embarrassment to this elite class of Babylonians, the knowledge of the wise men is weakened before the plans of Yahweh's messengers, which are fulfilled by Yahweh himself. 
the arresting message of this honor and shame is to make evident the magnitude of Yahweh's sovereignty, the maker of all. Significantly, these verses indicate that Yahweh impartially manifests his sovereignty over earth and humanity. We come to the final part, the agents of Yahweh, earth and humanity. Yahweh's redemptive and creative acts in history are carried out by his divinely appointed agents, not just humans, but earth included. As their sovereign master, he empowers them to fulfill his divine promises. If you look into the Hebrew text of verses 27 and verses 28, we can divide it into two parts. The first part, it presents earth as Yahweh's agent, and it plays a re retrospective role. It means, retrospective means going back, whereas verse 27, 28 plays a prospective role. It is looking towards the future. In 27, now if you do the textual analysis, it says, I will dry up your rivers. Now when we hear these words, we have a conceptual link going to the Old Testament where Yahweh dried up the Red Sea to free the people of Israel. Now this is just a con conceptual link. But if we go into the textual, the wordings of the text, we see here the two words I have given Isaiah 27. The word is Hadid, Hadib. And in Exodus also, we have to first see the, these three syllables. Dalet, Bet. And here we have Hashid, Dalet, Bet. Now the same root which is found in Exodus 14.21 is also found in Isaiah 44.27. And drying up, which is found in Isaiah 44.27, the same root, Yod, Bet, Shem, these three, and here is the Yod is not sent because it is uh, in grammar, you never find a Yod when you... Uh, what do you call, when you have a different person speaking, uh, what do you call that? I don't get the name. Beth and Shem. So we have not only the context, conceptual link, but also a textual link. It means, therefore, the text when Isaiah speaks, I will dry up our rivers, he is taking the Israelites, the Judeans who are in exile, back to their redemption in Egypt. So therefore, in this way, it plays a retrospective role. And a prospective role is played through the agency of humanity, of Cyrus. From the past, the text swiftly travels to the future by pointing to the forthcoming divinely appointed human agent in the person of Cyrus, whom Yahweh calls Roi, my shepherd, and who is destined to fulfill all of Yahweh's wishes. This verse clearly demonstrates that Yahweh had, is, and will carry his works of redemption through human agents, weak or strong, an Israelite or a foreigner. Now our textual interpretation of Isaiah 27, 28 presents an eco-conscious reading of the text where the members of the earth community, humanity and earth, work in unison to carry out Yahweh's plan of salvation. Now to sum up, the principle of intrinsic worth, voice and interconnectedness. The structural analysis of verses 21, 23 has unveiled to us, first, there are two addresses, humanity and earth. Second, the addresser is Yahweh, God, who as redeemer and shaper of Israel, together with the role as creator of all things, invites both the addresses to respond to his invitation conveyed in the form of imperatives. These two observations relate the text to the principle of intrinsic worth. Both are given the respect and honor due to them. Relatedly, earth can be viewed as a subject with an active voice that responds to the call of its creator to rejoice at the redemption of its skin, humanity. This observation counterreads the traditional 
anthropocentric reading which sidelined earth and its constituents as a mere object in the conventional hymnology. Moreover, earth being invited by Yahweh to rejoice at the redemption of its counterpart, humanity, underscores the principle of interconnectedness. Through the miracle of nature, that is ex Exodus, Yahweh saved Israel from the slavery of the Egyptians, Exodus 14. This was an event to be specially remembered and celebrated by every Israelite for posterity. Yahweh's call to remember this specific act, among many other redemptive acts, implicitly indicates the interconnectedness between humans and earth. Just as earth became and still remains a medium of salvation and sustenance for countless members of our human species, we are obligated to maintain the equilibrium that is disturbed and sadly degenerated to its lowest ebbs. Our text challenges us to heal this relationship by mending our selfish and domineering ways. The principle of purpose. The principle of purpose is gleaned from the reading of verses 27 to 28, which indicates humanity and earth as agents of human, as agents of Yahweh. Whether by means of the miracle of nature or by the miracle of human nature, God is shown by historical fact to be the Redeemer. With Yahweh as the common, common denominator, both humans and earth should work in unison to carry on the purposes of their master. This team spirit can, and in turn, unravel the beauty that, that, that exists within each member, where, thereby residing in mutual respect. And the final, contemporary relevance and conclusion. Protect Mother Earth, save the planet for future gener generations. Solutions, not pollution, are some of the many po powerful slogans that resonate on the streets of our villages, cities, and countries, calling for our urgent attention to the seriousness consequences that awaits us if we procrastinate our decisions in a fight for eco-justice. As readers, teachers, and followers of the Bible, there is an urgent need for a radical posturing, reading the Bible from the perspective of earth. As we have demonstrated that God has, as master of the universe, impartially engages with human agency and with the constituents of earth, sun, rain, dew, lightning, thunder, mountains, to accomplish his purposes in history. Thus, humanity and earth both become agents with an active voice to accomplish his divine purposes. Moreover, as Yahweh's agents, they are called to respond in acknowledgement for, of their related purposes. As it is evident, there is no idea of one domineering over the other. Both have an equitable role to play in God's plan. Whether or not you read about earth in precisely this way, the task of reading the text from an ecological perspective entails first, acknowledging the probable anthropocentric biases both within the text and within traditional interpretations. Second, identifying with earth and earth community as keen who are subjects in the narrative or poetry. And third, seeking to retrieve the perspective or voice of the earth community of whom we humans are but one species. Thank you. Thank you, Father Santosh, for this wonderful scholarly presentation of your paper, Voices of Earth and Humanity as Yahweh's agents in Isaiah 44, 21 to 28. My dear friends, on the 5th of June, we celebrated World Environment Day. And just now, we have listened to Father Santosh illuminating us on this ever important subject once again. 
So at the beginning, before I try to summarize this scholarly paper of Father Santosh, I hope I do justice to it. Let me first congratulate him. Santosh, congratulations. The freshness that Father Santosh brings to this paper is his application of ecological hermeneutics to the text. He states that the earth is facing an environmental crisis and we as religious leaders can no longer turn a blind eye to this reality. Being created in the image and likeness of God does not mean that humans have the right to be God. He says that the interpretative ideas of domination of the earth found in Genesis 1, 26 and 28 tend to devalue the earth and hence he proposes reading the scriptures from the perspective of the earth community. By such a reading, he says we are no longer stewards over creation, but relatives, he uses the word kin, within the earth community. And so taking a cue from the Earth Bible Project, he presents to us six eco-justice principles. One, the principle of intrinsic worth. Two, the principle of interconnectedness, which he says the earth is a community of interconnected living things. The principle of voice, the earth is subject, capable of raising its voice in celebration and against injustice. The principle of purpose, earth and all its components are important pieces of an overall design. The fifth one is the principle of mutual custodianship and sixth, the principle of resistance. But Santosh then went on to introduce to us due to Isaiah and its historical setting within which the pericope under study is situated. Due to Isaiah, he reminds us, is called the prophet of consolation, giving hope to the Babylonian exiles. Scholars have often deciphered the language of creation and redemption in these texts. So, an ecological reading of Isaiah 44, 21 to 28, leads him to raise the question, why the earth is called upon to shout for joy at the redemption of Israel. In the scriptures, he asks, have humans ever rejoiced at the accomplishments of earth? The structure of Isaiah 44, 21 to 28, he presents to us saying, is indicative of these principles of interconnectedness, voice, and purpose. The pericope, he divides into two parts, part one, verses 21 to 23, where we have Israel and earth as addressees. Israel as addressee is decreed to remember and return to Yahweh, thereby demonstrating a personal and intimate relationship. This closeness is because Israel is his redeemed servant. The earth as a dressy is directed to sing, shout, and break forth in rejoicing, for the Lord had redeemed Jacob. This jubilation indicates that earth as a subject has its inherent worth and expresses joy at the redemption of humanity, its kin, thus highlighting the interconnectedness between earth and humanity. And just as Yahweh exhorts humanity to witness the acts of redemptions, so also earth is called to share in the joy of human redemption. 
Part 2 of his exegesis, verses 24 to 28, speaks about the sovereignty of Yahweh over creation and humanity. From the creation of all things to the call of King Cyrus, everything emanates from Yahweh. It is Yahweh who confounds the knowledge of the wise and the diviners while he establishes the word of his servants. Further, he says, earth and humanity act as divine agents of Yahweh for the redemption of Israel. Then the mention of the deep and your rivers designate the earth as an instrument in the hands of Yahweh, while the appointment of Cyrus, king of Persia, as shepherd of Yahweh, who will fulfill the purpose, points to a divinely appointed human agent. Father Santosh then went on to apply three principles of this eco-justice principles. Principle of voice and the principle of interconnectedness. The principle of voice gives speech to the earth to raise its voice against injustice as well as in celebration. The principle of interconnectedness seeks to highlight the mutual dependency of the earth community, humanity and nature for life and survival. Here, the addresser, Yahweh, invites the addressees, humanity and earth, to respond to his invitation of creation and redemption. The invitation to earth to rejoice at the redemption of humanity emphasizes the principle of interconnectedness and voice. The principle of purpose Yahweh is the greatest common denominator in the fact of redemption of creation and humanity. In this endeavor, both humans and the earth work in unison to carry on the purpose of their master. Finally, coming to the contemporary relevance, Father Santos says that the text Isaiah 44, 21 to 28 which we have dealt with, is an invitation to remember and to return to Yahweh, thus challenging humanity to recognize the interconnectedness that exists between humanity and the earth. This realization will pave the way for mutual custodianship with the earth community. Serious consequences await humanity if we delay our decision to fight climate change. There is an urgent need to refrain from exploiting the earth and to heed the call to become earth warriors and savor the treasures of the earth. In the universe are billions of galaxies in our galaxy are billions of planets, but there is only one Earth. Let us listen to its voice. Let us take care of it. One of the points that you highlighted is that, uh, that we need to re-look at our role as humans, and in that connection you said that we are we have to move from the idea that we are stewards to a new role as kin if i have got you right yeah. so how that change of role will translate into change of our responsibility with regards to earth is there, will there uh, translate into a different sense of responsibility that would have with regards to earth? I would give a simple example. Now, 
as a common man, a common man if he works in the office, and a common man, his relationship, if you relate to, a, to his relationship with his uh, workers and his relationship with his wife and children, how would it be? Would it be the same as he has the relationship with the worker? Or would that be, would that relationship, would, would it be on an equal footing? No. He would relate to his uh, Keith and Keen, his wife, his children, in a different way. He would show more love, more responsibility, more, he would, in a way, he would empathize, identify with them. But that case would not happen with his being the steward or the caretaker of his workers. So if we identify, if we understand this idea, a similar process can take place when we move from being stewards, move from being caretakers to being a relative or a keen to the, to the understanding. Therefore, there is a need of this posturing from moving away from just understanding from the biblical perspective of stewardship as caretakers to being more, you know, St. Francis, uh, that same author which I quoted in 1967, Lean White, he said, he calls St. Francis, the of Assisi, as the patron, he proposes St. Pa Francis of Assisi as the patron of ecologists. And he says, Francis tried to depose man from his monarchy over creation and set up a democracy for all God's creatures. So in a way, moving away from a monarchy where you being the king rule over the entire creation to a democracy where all are involved in the action. You see this triangle, this is the earth community. Yahweh, land and people. So when two of the components interact with each other, the third one is necessarily involved. Therefore, when God, therefore, when both this Yahweh and earth are in interaction, Yahweh is also involved. When Yahweh and earth are in interaction, therefore, the earth also is influenced. But this is the triangle of the earth community. Thank you. What about man's uh, freedom, man's responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the earth? The earth has its freedom, the responsibility, or is it the man who takes the leadership and responsibility and so you are means you are understanding that earth also has a freedom. that means you are relating to the principle of subject right as earth being a subject with freedom to act no i don't want to par the mm -hmm. equal status to man and earth mm -hmm. because man has uh, intellect freedom yeah. and he can abuse it yeah. because of the freedom so but the earth has no freedom so it cannot abuse it can react yeah only that is my point so you cannot par it okay yeah we cannot par it but in the way they are not too equal therefore i said the equitable role I did not say the equal role, no? There is a difference between it equitable and equal. Equitable role, uh, if you understand the difference. Can the principle of ecological hermeneutics be applied to Genesis 1.26 and if so, how? Authority in the ecological hermeneutics is Norman Habel. And the first uh, Ecological, the Earth Bible project was started in Australia in 2003. And therefore, I said it is just in its germinating stage, just 20 years old, this field of studies. It is just a skeleton. We have to add a lot of flesh. And he has written this uh, ecological hermeneutics from the perspective, and he has done a study on this uh, Genesis 1 26 to 28. I would only note one thing. Generally, we translate the words, there are two words there in Hebrew, Radha. Radha means to rule over. 
it is ruling over it shows you are doing it by force and it is usually applied in ancient near east this word we find it in literature which was used by the kings when whenever we had the sovereign vassal treaty the sovereign would rule over so this verb was used in those contexts radha exercising his power by force and there is another word which is used there in hebrew called kabesh kabesh means subduing and a similar word we use it in joshua verses uh, chapter 18 verse 1 where joshua kabesh joshua subdues the philistines and the neighboring nations so this idea of a force an external force is applied this is the suspicion the idea now when you identify the process of identification would involve now you put yourself on the place of earth would you like to be subdued would you like to be ruled over by somebody or would you like to be an equal partner or an equitable partner with others and the idea of a retrieval would mean if you go to if you read not just genesis 1:26 therefore as today the archbishop also was telling to read the transfiguration we have to understand the context we have to go from 21 to 27 to understand what the transfiguration really means therefore to understand to retrieve the understanding from the perspective of earth we have to first understand what genesis 1 from verses 1 and the following says if you go to see we are just concentrated on this verse is domination but if you read from verses 1 to 25 god creates earth first and from earth is born other living creatures the water the seas and everything comes into being so when you when we see here when we place earth as the prominent place that from earth is born these other things who becomes the subject the earth becomes the subject so therefore and it is then when you apply this retrieval and this ideas you posture yourself with earth you posture yourself that earth becomes a subject it is not just an object which is created by god but it is from earth itself that things come into being so this is the uh, short understanding brief understanding could you help us discern god's presence in the earth in the nature because i think if we have that consciousness of seeing god's presence in the earth many of the problems will be solved so how what is your outlook on this now what i have presented it is more of a orientation so this is could be the first step and the next step would be to feel the presence of god in nature so that is a different level of understanding but what i have presented is from this first you need to posture yourself try to do away with the biases that are present identify and then retrieve the textual traditions which are there the because the text itself is so rich and then then we try to face as i had uh, when i had presented about verse 40 chapter 43 verse 23 about the metaphor of voice so the idea understanding that mountain singing is quite alien to us but it was not alien if we have seen the movie avatar and now avatar 2 also is coming you see there is a the avatar idea uh, he was uh, james cameron was far ahead of his time means uh, if you are a student of if you wish to be a student of ecological hermeneutics watch avatar and he shows the deep connections the rootedness of how these people are rooted with nature i remember the last scene when the their planet is about to be destroyed they all gather around a tree and the tree roots are in sync with their own bodies it's a beautiful depiction it shows the deep rootedness the interconnectedness that we have with the nature and the inter- and us as humans few years back the the man was the center of domination and he had to conquer the himalayas he had to conquer the antarctic ocean and he had to achieve a lot of things but right now he has achieved a lot of things 
you want to exploded the atom and also the universe so now with your presentation you have bought the earth on par with man don't you think there will be consequences of this understanding because it's not the traditional understanding but it's a different understanding uh, what consequences do you expect to see with this change of thought something thought came to my mind are we going back to our ancient roots where still now in nagar haveli we have that nature worship are we going to return to that nature worship i had that first uh, prejudice and then i asked pro- posed a question to my professor are we through this understanding going to return back to that going back as nature worshipers but uh, what he said was it is not about nature worship it is identifying our roots with nature one you we have our roots you know we have our roots with nature because nature responds therefore we have only have to because of this in western there are dualisms no earth heaven body soul and therefore we always the what we placed before like uh, if we place the heavens and the earth so the heaven is a much more higher or a higher entity than earth therefore we make this dualisms but in scripture in quite in ancient tradition if we read the ancient near east, east texts this dualisms are not present this are only the western thought which is come into the later in the 15th 16th centuries this dualisms came and then we are influenced and we try to conform our thoughts with relates to this western dualisms unless and until we break forth from this dualistic ideas this dualistic ideas then uh, this process would not have a good consequence it would be, mean something it can lead us to a different way but if we try to posture ourselves from and read the text from the perspective of earth it's only then we can understand the harm that we are doing through our actions it is like remembering you remember that earth has fed you earth has protected you and it is now your time to return to your roots and respect the the thing that has cared for you the lord says all the earth is mine let us listen to the earth's voice and do our part and get united as kin of earth participate in this beautiful uh, very well uh, depicted in the triangle relationship with god with earth and humanity thank you very much and god bless you